I guess I'm a meteorologist. I measure the size of things because size affects so many things that you'll come across in your daily walk of life. And that's some of the examples I wanted to really enthuse you about. Any, everything you deal with has been designed to work. So everything from a can of deodorant to a cup of coffee is being designed to be the way you want it. And a lot of, the, of that is down to the properties of the particles that are in these actual systems. So it's really how formulation science impacts your life. To start with, we're going to be talking about particles. Really, it's worth thinking, what is a particle? It's really a tiny piece of matter. And naturally occurring particles are things like sand, soils, clay, pollen, dust, smoke, fog. But of course, a lot of people make them as well. What forms do we encounter particles in? Well, some of them are going to be dry powders, salt, sugar, flour, suspensions, which is particles in a liquid, paints, inks, emulsions, milk, yogurt, and the like, or sprays, deodorants, asthma inhalers. So what properties of these uh, these suspensions and things we deal with on a daily, uh, daily basis are really important. Well, the size is important, but so is also the spread of sizes within a product. So is the shape of the material. Uh, its surface, is it a spiky particle or is it a nice smooth one? Uh, how strong is it? Is it going to break? And one of the other things is the charge on a, on a particle. We've always come across things like, which have separated. Like, uh, I mean, you, before milk was homogenized, in the, in the sort of 60s and 70s, when you used to have, when mi milkmen delivering milk, you'd see uh, often the cream would separate to the top. And that's because the, uh, before it was homogenized, it was slightly bigger in size, and the charge wouldn't be that great, and you'd get separation occurring. Or your particles might be slightly hollow, so that they've got some kind of structure inside them. So really, we're talking about how to predict how a product is going to work. So this could be, for a drug, how it's going to dissolve. Because if things are the wrong size, it's going to dissolve too quickly, it's and the drug could end up in the wrong part of the body. The content uniformity in tablets. A tablet will consist of things like lactose, which is like a sugar, and the actual active ingredient of a drug. And you want the same, every tablet to be the same. What you, uh, when they make the tablets, they put so much of each ingredient. It's just like making a cake. You're putting in so much active and so much of the, the sugars to suspend the actual dr uh, the drug in the tablet. But if all the, uh, the drug ended up in one tablet and all the filler in another, in another you're going to have problems because you could have an overdose. So working out the same content is equal on all tablets is really important. Chocolate, we'll talk about, about this as an example in a minute, but the tongue is a really sensitive sizing instrument. If s something tastes greasy or gritty, it's too big. If it tastes smooth, it's small. St uh, we talked about, again, stability. Uh, the charge is important. Again, if it, it, uh, otherwise you can get separation of any, s of any uh, medicine. And that's why a lot of, you still see it on bottles, shake well before use. And that's because the, the ingredients may well have separated and you're going to resuspend them. And the ketchup, the squeezability or flowability of a, of a, of a particle will, will depend on, uh, oh, of a suspension, will depend on the particles within it. The color. Well, is size dependent. And so is the flowability of a powder. As things get smaller, they get stickier. It's all to do with the, the van der Waals forces between a product. They build up, and it's much harder to separate uh, icing sugar than it is, say, granulated sugar. The finer materials are, the stickier they get. So everything we encounter has been uh, formulated by scientists to work in the way you expect. 
uh, and a lot of this is really based around what you'd encounter in the day. So when you wake up, you might uh, sort of like have a shower and then, uh, then put some deodorant or something on or hairspray. Uh, there's a big market for spray systems, which includes perfumes, deodorants, hairsprays, furniture polish, air fresheners, cleaning products and the like. The particle size and the rheology, which is really the thickness of the liquid that's in there, is quite important. Because if a liquid's a bit like syrup and you try and force it through a spray pump, it's not going to form a particularly great spray. But if it's more like water, it's going to get a finer droplet size. So really the thickness of a liquid is quite important. We want to try and avoid things being too small so they end up in the, uh, in the lungs. Unless it's an asthma inhaler and that's the whole point at the first place. I mean, my wife's deodorant, I think, is, is very fine because when she's using it in the morning, I often get a coughing fit because you can actually feel it entering your lungs. So it's obviously got quite a small size. But if we take something like hairspray, the hold of the hairspray is size related. It's exactly the same formulation. So you get exactly the, between firm hold or natural hold, it's the same stuff. They just have a higher content of particles in, uh, in the strong stuff, the extra firm hold, than they do in the natural hold. So it produces a bigger droplet size, which has more grip on the hair. But it's exactly the same formulation. They've just got more particles in there. Coffee is a really interesting one. Uh, obviously, the fineness of your coffee, uh, what you like, will depend on uh, whether you like espresso or filter coffee or the like. It has a completely different size, which influences the flavor. So if you've got a coffee grinder and can control the blend, uh, uh, you can actually get a more bitter coffee by turning it up to maximum, uh, maximum, which will produce a finer coffee. But if you have it on the first setting, it's going to taste very weak. But if it's too much, it might taste very bitter to you. And this is because when you brew coffee, there's uh, obviously the coffee hits the water, and the finer the particles are, there's a, uh, almost more surface area for reaction and extraction of the flavors which come out of the coffee. And so small changes in grind size can drastically affect the flavor of your brew. And here we see three different kinds of coffee with three different size distributions. And what are they? Well, we take a fairly sort of, uh, American Starbucks-y kind of blend, a, f a typical French roast, you, it's got a fairly big particle size, and that would produce a fairly mild kind of taste. If you take something like espresso, it's much, much smaller. And that's going to be why it's got a much more of a caffeine kick and a much stronger flavor. And if we take something like a Turkish coffee, again, that's a, uh, a completely different size distribution and will be m even much stronger even again than espresso is. And, but that also has, there's so many fine particles in there. If you have Turkish coffee, you can kind of taste them in your mouth as well. Chocolate, another really interesting compound. It's a solid at room temperature, but it's actually a liquid at body temperature. So it produces, because it will melt in your mouth as it starts to, to in increase, which is why it's quite a unique eating experience. It's quite a complex flavor, and we kind of modify this a little bit by adding milk, and adding sugar, and it's big business, 100 billion in 2015. It's a matrix of fat, which is generally cocoa butter, but in the UK, we often like to add vegetable oil as well. It's got emulsifiers, normally in the form of a, uh, a naturally uh, occurring ingredient, which occurs in soybeans and egg yolk called lecithin, which helps emulsify the cocoa butter and solid particles, which are the cocoa solids, sugar, and milk powder. So what are we looking for in the bar of chocolate? Well, the mouthfeel. Coarse particles make the chocolate seem quite gritty and unpleasant. Uh, I shouldn't mention brand names here, but a big American brand of chocolate, which isn't normally found much in this country, has, a, to us, tastes quite unpleasant because it's much larger, larger particle size. But some parts of the world, that's what they're used to. So we can detect on the tongue about 30 microns in size. 
So anything smaller than that just tastes nice and smooth. Anything bigger than that, you can start to feel it on your tongue. Small particles uh, will take, can often take longer to melt, which means they may stay solid in the mouth for longer. Uh, larger size may also le lead to the flavors coming out much slower. Uh, finer size, though, there's a bounce. You don't want to go too fine because you need more cocoa butter to disperse the cocoa solids if you're too fine. Cocoa butter is the most expensive ingredient. So if you go too fine, your bar of chocolate to cost you more to manufacture. So there's a balance between too coarse, tastes unpleasant, too fine, too expensive to produce. And so it's a fine line you're trying to control. And also by milling finer, you're taking money to do that because you've got to put a grinder on and it's going to take up energy. So, and it's, as we said, there's a cost implication in the raw materials. And also the wider size, if it's a big size distribution, it, uh, it may reduce the kind of thickness of the sus uh, suspension, which is also important when you think about low-fat chocolates. So anything over 30 microns is detectable <coughs> by your tongue. It feels gritty. A lot of people prefer a smoother mouthfeel. If we take chocolates that are supposed to be have a smooth mouthfeel, and you actually do measure the size, they are indeed smaller. So if we take three chocolates, dark chocolate, white chocolate, and milk chocolate, and we look at the size distributions, you see there's quite big differences. The big peak here, uh, uh, we think, is sugar. And then the, the smaller ones are going to be milk solids, cocoa solids, and the like, and cocoa butter. This is from the same manufacturer, but it's three different kinds of chocolates. So you can see that the type is depending on uh, the size. But if we take some uh, different types of chocolate, such as enrobing chocolate, that's the kind of chocolate that may go around a soft center. So, uh, so it's going to enrobe as something else, like some fondant cream or something, or uh, just chocolate powder. Again, those are quite different particle sizes, so the taste is gonna, and mouthfeel is going to be completely different. Or if we take something else you encounter in everyday life, paint. In the old days, when you got some paint back from the shop, you'd often have to stir it because you'd uh, pop open the lid, there's a layer of pigment on the top, and then the, the rest of it's underneath. Now we tend to take it for granted, or we take it back to the shop and complain if it's separated. And the, the reason for, for this has been, I guess, looking at the formulation and the charge on the particles. Because if the particles are like magnets, if, if they can actually have got the same charge and it's a strong charge, if they come together, they repel each other. But if a charge is weak, they start to all stick together. It might not be strong sticking together, but they're going to form little networks, and they're going to separate. It's a bit like forming cheese. So it's all forming a kind of like loose kind of structure. Uh, but if you shake it up enough, it can resuspend itself. But over time, they might, uh, in things like milk, it forms uh, an unbreakable bond. But it, in a lot of these cases, it's like a loose, lo uh, loose flocculation. You shake it, and it all separates. And it, it's been designed now to be easily handle, handleable and to have no brush strokes. And if we look at the size here of a paint, you can see that the fine particles, they, they're responsible for the opacity of a paint. And then the, the medium ones are really how glossy it is. And that's where it really should end. If there's some big bits in there, that's where you start to see imperfections, which don't, don't look good on the wall or the finish. And that's what they're trying to avoid. Uh, the dissolution rate for drugs, the finer it is, the quicker it dissolves. We touched on that at the start. Cement. Cement is too fine. It sets too hot and you get cracks. But if it's too uh, big, it's not very strong. So again, there's this line between not being too fine, not being too coarse that you need to control. And also, it, uh, it used to be that 2% of the world's energy was spent in the grinding of cement. And that's a huge electricity bill. So if you overgrind, your power bills are absolutely astronomical. Asthma inhalers, the, uh, the deeper uh, that you want to go into the lung, the finer the particle size you're generally engineering the particles to be. Batteries, uh, battery technology has had massive leaps and bounds over the last 10, 15 years. And that's going to increase with electric cars, 
uh, becoming more prevalent on the roads. Uh, the surface area of the particles leads more efficient reactions between the electrolyte and the anode or the cathode in the batteries. Sunscreen and other cosmetics, again, you're controlling the size because you want to repel the sunlight from you. Sauces and flavorings, again, you want a small, uh, small size, large particle sizes uh, produce a kind of greasy mouthfeel. Particle size is also important. And, uh, and molecular weight in plastics and how plastics behave and the color of plastics, their strengths. As a final point, what I want to touch on is international standards. A lot of people think, oh, standards and things are kind of like a nanny state mentality, someone trying you what to do. But the other way of looking at it, it guarantees that, uh, I guess, consumer rights are such that you will have something and it will work. And if you have the same product, it's made the same way, you'll get the same experience all over the world. And from an instrumentation point of view, with some of the standards I write, you're actually really providing, I guess, non-manufacturer user manual. So you're imparting the information on how to get the best out of a particular technology. So really anyone could pick this up and get great results uh, from the get-go. Okay, hopefully I've given you some good, some interesting ideas about uh, how particles are important in your everyday life. And hopefully in th uh, next time you ch pick up a cup of coffee, you might think, oh, uh, I now know what's giving the flavor. Or pick up a bar of chocolate and think, ah, right. And you can say, ah, uh, your mouth can det only detect particles that are less than 30 microns. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>